me hit the record. Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. We are about to kick off this third quarter business development uh, seminar off on this evening. We are also streaming live to Facebook. And we want to thank everybody in advance in our Facebook world for those that's with us in uh, on the Zoom platform tonight. Uh, we have a phenomenal guest speaker. We have several, actually. Um, so for those that may not know me, I am Catherine Trotter. I'm your host for this evening. I'm a business strategist. We always host monthly business educational workshops for business owners, and we always bring on guest speakers that can bring real information that can help you grow your business. So tonight is legal night, right? So we have two phenomenal attorneys that are with us. But to kick it off, that we know there are a lot of nonprofits that I've worked with over the years, and it's been common questions like if I decide to lobby or I want to lobby, how do I even go about that process? Well, you know what? We got a specialist that's going to speak on that very topic on tonight. Uh, Mrs. Martin, she is the founder and principal consultant. And let me tell you something. She just released a book. It's hot off the press, The Nonprofit Lobbyist, right? Um, she hails from the Indiana area. However, she does serve nationwide. Um, without further ado, I would like to bring on Mrs. Martin. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited Absolutely. to share. You know what, before we even get into all the Q&A, first tell everyone, what was your passion? Why did you even go into the legal arena? Yeah, I just wanted to, I, when I first graduated from law school, I was in litigation. I was a family law attorney. Um, and I also did some child protection cases for children who were in CPS. And I, I love the work, but I just felt like I, I was only helping one child and one family at a time, which is great. But um, I got into public policy because I really wanted to help the masses. Mm -hmm. Once you start getting into government and law, you start being able to really impact things on the macro level scale. So you go beyond just helping individuals and families, you start being able to impact neighborhoods, cities, and states. Um, and so I just wanted to just be able to learn how to how to impact on a larger scale. So that's why I got into law and policy. So, so listen, everyone on this platform, on Zoom, or those that's watching on Facebook, we know that you want to make an impact on a larger scale. That's what my takeaway from what I'm hearing. You said you got into law, you went into that industry, you went into that pathway because you wanted to make a larger impact. So for everyone that's watching right now, I want you to think about what type of impact do you want to make in your community, in your state, uh, it, nationwide? What type of ripple effect will you have in your own community? Well, you have a book that was just released. Yep. Talk a little bit about the book before we go into the questions. What what inspired you to write the book? Yeah, so I um, when I first started my public policy career, I was working as a legislative researcher for a human trafficking organization. And so my background was with organizations that were lobbying. I decided later on that I wanted to expand my services to other like smaller nonprofits. Um, but when I did some market research, I found that a lot of nonprofits thought that nonprofit lobbying was illegal, um, that it was corrupt, that it was sleazy. They just were completely just anti-lobbying. And that really bothered me because I came from uh, organizations where that was a core activity. Mm -hmm. And um, I just feel like the nonprofit sector is just like a sleeping giant. We have, especially in numbers, we have like a huge opportunity to really bring the interests of our communities before the legislative decision makers. And But there's just a lack of information about how to go about that. It's very overwhelming. And so I decided to write a book as a resource for nonprofits to go to, to kind of get a step-by-step -step guide on how to start. Um, and not just how to start lobbying, but also like gain leverage by writing a bill proposal, because that's actually something that can help you really put your your grassroots ideas into a concrete like legislative language. Um, so my book goes into again where to how to start lobbying, how to prepare, but also how to write a bill proposals so that you can create the change that you want to see and put it on paper. Um, so that's what the nonprofit lobbyist um, is about, and I'm really proud and excited to share it. So. Thank you so much. For those that are just tuning in now, um, whether you're on the feed on Facebook or whether you are about to join on Zoom, you're tuned in to the third quarter business development seminar hosted by my company, CTR Strategy Solutions. We are joined by Attorney Martin. We're also joined by our co-host, Mr. Mark Wiggins, who you'll hear from in just a moment. Um, tonight, we have several questions, some common questions that we have received or thought about that most nonprofit organizations have if they want to decide to go and lobby. So one of the, the first question is, what is what are some of the biggest reasons so many nonprofits are hesitant to engage in lobbying? Yeah, I think the, the biggest reason is that um, 
there's this misconception that nonprofit lobbying is, is illegal. Um, and I think that stems from the, the language that's actually in the federal tax code. Um, the tax code does say that nonprofits can lobby, but only in an insubstantial amount. But the problem is that it doesn't really go into detail about what insubstantial means. You know, is it 1%, is it 5%, is it 10%? Um, and so historically, nonprofits have kind of shied away from lobbying because they just really don't know how much they can do without jeopardizing their tax, tax exempt status. Um, and then over the years, it morphed into this idea that, you know, nonprofits just can't do it at all. Um, but that is a myth. It's not true um, that nonprofits can't lobby. In fact, they are encouraged to lobby. Um, and I think the second reason is that nonprofits feel that lobbying is corrupt. Like there's this idea that whenever we talk about any kind of government work, it involves like sliding a cash, a bag of cash to legislators or um, just like trying donating to their reelection campaign to get them to vote for favorable legislation. Um, but while that does exist, you know, I don't want to be naive about the fact that there is corruption, but it just really doesn't happen on the scale that most people think it does. Um, the lobbyists are a really great resource for legislators who really want to know what's, what's going on on the ground. They're a great source of you know, knowledge and expertise. Um, and then at the core of it, you know, nonprofits are not allowed to dedicate or not allowed to contribute to a legislator's reelection campaign at all. It's completely prohibited. It's illegal. You could lose your tax exempt status for doing it. Um, so to the extent that, you know, legal bribery, as it's called, does exist, 501c3s just can't engage in it at all. And it really is um, dependent upon legislators to who care about nonprofit causes uh, to really champion those social issues. So, you know, contrary to, comp to um, contrary to popular belief, there are legislators who care about nonprofit causes. You just have to find them. Um, and then the third reason that nonprofits don't lobby is because they feel it's outside of their mission. Um, a lot of nonprofits are focused on, on only on direct services. And while that's that's great and that's necessary and much needed, um, I like to kind of encourage nonprofits to consider lobbying, not as something outside of their mission, but an extension of a mission. So you're not really like, you know, neglecting your, your core issue or your core community, you're just impacting a larger number of people. So instead of impacting individuals, you're impacting cities, neighborhoods, and even states. Um, so yeah, those are probably the main reasons why only 3% of nonprofits lobby. Kevin, yeah, 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 go ahead, jump in. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yeah. I have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for, for the work you do. It, it, people, do you think that people just don't really know how to lobby? Like, what what is lobbying? Mm -hmm. You follow someone like AARP. Who, who I've been getting mail since I don't know six years ago, and mm -hmm. boy, they're one of the biggest lobbying firms around. They mm -hmm. lobby heavy for the community. But what do you think about that? We don't even know what to lobby for. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a lot. We just don't really know what it is. Like I said, a lot of people think that lobbying is going to a legislator and saying, hey, if you pass this law, I'll give you $20,000. You know, there's so it's lobby. The definition of lobbying is simply to influence a legislator to support or oppose legislation. That's it. It doesn't inherently involve, you know, cash or donations. Um, it's simply just advocating for for your legislature, whether it be local, state or federal, to pass a a law that will benefit your community. And that's what it is. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of misconceptions about what it is and how to go about it. So that's my that's my work. Yeah. Okay, so I have a follow question. Sorry, Catherine. Mm -hmm. oh, so I want to know, can you can you provide an example of what a local foundation who started for a reason, let's say they started for drunk driving, um, gun violence or whatever, mm -hmm. how would that organization really start lobbying lobbying locally? Because that's really what they're trying to do anyway. They just don't know they can do it. How would, how would right. that look? Um, so, well, first, there's a number of like compliance issues uh, that nonprofits don't know about that my, my book talks about, too. Um, so you have to make sure that you're lobbying within your allowable limits, which the tax code does talk about. There's like a whole provision in there that tells you how much lobbying you can do based on how much money you make per year. Um, so I would definitely look at that, look at the tax code and make sure that you're staying within your limits um, and then make sure that you uh, have a, a way to record your lobbying activities because that's like the foundation of compliance. And then um, also make sure that you know the um, registration and reporting requirements at the level that you want to lobby. So there's um, the local government, state government, and even the federal government have um, reporting requirements because every, they all want to know, you know who's trying to influence the government. Um, and so you have to comply with those things before you even start your, your, before you even send your first email. So a lot of nonprofits, they get 
when they find out they can lobby, they get excited and they start setting up meetings, but there's this whole bunch of you know, legal groundwork that has to be laid first. Then you can send your first email and set up a meeting um, and, uh, and go from there. If that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, it makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, good. And anyone that's watching on Facebook, I want to give a quick shout out to Christopher on Facebook that's watching. You'll actually be hearing from him on Thursday when we do our workshop, but Christopher is an investment advisor. So if you're on Facebook, you can drop your questions. For those that's on Zoom, you can also drop any questions in the chat box. Um, so the book that you have, Attorney Martin, is that a step-by-step -step process to help someone if they wanted to lobby? So I think one of the part two question was, why is it so important for nonprofits to lobby? But I think the question that Mark asks is, is important, you know, like, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's a, some skepticism, not because one may not want to, but how to. So if you could just right. kind of share some of those fundamental steps. Yeah. So um, once you get all the legal compliance stuff together, um, you would, you know, send an email to set up a meeting with your legislator through their staffers. It's very rare, excuse me, it's very rare that you would be able to speak directly with your legislator, especially like the higher up you go. Your local legislators, yeah, you might be able to email them directly, um, but on the state and federal level, you have to go through their team of administrators called their staffers. Um, so you would send an email saying, you know, we would we're, we have these concerns in our community. We wanna speak to, you know, Senator or representative such and such about addressing it through a piece of legislation. Um, so you set up that meeting and um, you want to be very um, short because a legislators don't have a lot of time. So you want to make sure that you have a prepared speech. You have like what's called a fact sheet, which is like a one page that really just condenses your issue into bullet points so that you can give your legislator like a quick overview of the issue. Um, and then what I advocate for very strongly is bringing like sample language of a, of a bill proposal, which is one of the things that I um, specialize in is helping you get your grassroots idea into legislative language. Then the legislator will introduce that into the legislature. It'll go through a committee. And throughout that process, you will continue to get um, to run a campaign, raising public awareness of, of the fact that a bill exists, getting the public to call their legislators, um, really just showing public support so that you can um, let your legislators know that this is an issue that's important to their constituents. Um, and that's just a general overview of the process. So. And so for those that are just watching now, or you may end up watching the replay, the first segment of our business development uh, workshop tonight is with attorney Martin. She specifically wrote a book uh, talking about the nonprofit lobbyist. So this first phase of the conversation is specifically for organizations. You have a nonprofit, you have a 501c3, or you have a grassroots organization, you have a great cause, but now you want to start tapping into legislation. Now you want to start seeing how your organization can influence a shift within your community, but from a legal perspective. And so that's the conversation that we're having right now. So one of the other follow-up questions was, what's one of the most memorable nonprofit lobbyist initiatives that you personally was a part of? Mm -hmm. um, I would say back in 2021, I worked with an organization back in, or based in Chicago, that was founded by a physician who uh, worked with low-income patients. Um, and when, when he would talk to these patients, he would find out that a lot of them had been impacted by gun violence. A lot of his patients had lost children um, to gun violence, but they couldn't afford to pay for their funeral and burial expenses. So they were going into debt, just trying to bury their loved one. They didn't have time to grieve because they were stressed out about how they were going to pay for, you know, just holding a, a funeral. Um, and so he um, contacted me because he wanted to, he wanted me to write a bill that would create or revise the state's um, victims compensation program because that program just had a lot of issues where people were overloaded with a lot of paperwork. Um, it was backlogged so people wouldn't get compensation for a few years. And it wasn't really a, it was more of a reimbursement program instead of a compensation program. So they would upfront, they'd have to spend thousands of dollars going to debt and then hope for uh, to be reimbursed when you know it may not have been, even been possible. So he um, approached me to write the bill. And in the background, he was doing a lot of um, like campaigning. He ran a grass, grassroots campaign. He had a lot of um, press conferences. Um, and that bill ended up passing the first session that was introduced. And if you know anything about lobbying, you know that that's very rare. Sometimes you know, it, it could take you know, several years for an initiative or a bill to pass. Um, and so it's, it's a really big, uh, big deal that it, it passed in the same session that it was introduced. And the bill ended up providing um, victims of gun violence or the families of children who were victims of gun violence 
with payments from the state to be able to pay for um, funeral and burial expenses so they wouldn't go into debt. Um, and so that impacted, you know, families all throughout Illinois and it was really big success. So. No, I mean, that's phenomenal. Yeah. You talk about the money aspect. So when you're trying to submit something for legislation or you want to lobby on a cause, what is the fin financial component for that for a nonprofit? Mm -hmm. or if any. Yeah, well, it, it, um, I mean, it costs money to go and, you know, meet with your legislator, just travel expenses. It costs money to register as a lobbyist if you're going to be doing a significant amount of lobbying. So that's one question. Before you go, before, move forward, what is the cost of becoming a lobbyist? So that, so the, anybody can be a lobbyist, but the cost really comes from uh, the registration as a lobbyist. So you have to register with the state if you're going to do a significant amount of it. And then, of course, there's those practical expenses like traveling to meet the legislator. Um, so, I mean, the lo a lobbyist is not necessarily like, there are people who work as lobbyists and get paid for it, but there are also individuals who, um, in communities who come together to approach their legislature um, for, to address issues. And that's not something they're necessarily compensated for, but there are expenses associated with, with, that, with that type of work. Um, and so like a lot standard fee though for lot I know you mentioned that you have to enter something in it so is is it is it different from state to state it varies from yeah so the registration and reporting fees those vary from state to state and they could range from you know a couple hundred dollars or maybe like I think there's some states actually there's no fee all the way up to maybe like you know three four hundred five hundred dollars mm -hmm. um so it can be pretty costly for a nonprofit that doesn't have that much funding um, but foundations are a great source of funding. Um, and then coalitions, and I can't stress this enough, is that the power of coalitions is partly because when you have, you know, 10, 20 nonprofits coming together and pooling their resources, that's where the funding comes to be able to engage in that type of work. And so one nonprofit may not be able, may not have the funding to do the work, but 10, 20, 30 nonprofits to create a coalition um, can share and pool their resources. And that's really where the power comes from. Let me jump in and ask you a yeah. question. Um, let's say, for instance, um, we're a nonprofit organization here, and we are focusing on um, uh, homelessness and children in the um, in the adoption cycle, right? Getting into adoption a system, and we want to lobby to help those children and the process of the adoptions and going into uh, foster care situations. How will mm -hmm. we start this process, and what we what would we need to do to get moving? So first, you would. Um you would need to create an advocacy plan. So you need to first um, create a plan that kind of highlights what people you need to talk to who can um, help and maybe introduce you to legislatures, who can help you create a coalition, um, the types of organizations that you want to be on your team as you approach a legislature. Um, and that plan could also involve you know, funding sources. It involves um, who you're going to approach to hold a press conference, um, reaching out to media contacts. Um, so it's basically a plan for raising public, public awareness, but also creating a team of people who are going to help you push your agenda forward. Then once you, and my book goes into detail also about like, the components of an advocacy plan. Um, then once you create your plan, then you can start setting up meetings with legislators who, and ideally you wanna do research on legislators who have historically um, like supported your issue. So you wanna find legislators in your state who have in, in the past like championed child welfare issues or adoption issues, um, who maybe have some um, maybe employment background um, or history with the child welfare uh, system. Um, and then you would approach those legislators specifically and say, say to them, hey, we have this change we want to make to the law. Can you introduce a bill that will make these changes? Um, and then that legislator will agree to create the bill. The bill goes to what's called a committee so the legislature is, is comprised of uh, commit, different committees based on different subject matter. Um, and so your bill would go to, I guess, like the child welfare committee, which is made up of legislators who have expertise or experience in child welfare. Um, and as it's going through the committee, eventually it will go to the floor, like the House and Senate floor for a vote. And throughout that process, you're continually raising public awareness through like a grassroots campaign, through social media, through press conferences, through newspapers. Um, and so it, re it really is a lot of working parts, um, but it's it's doable, especially if you have a step by step guide. So, mm -hmm. so, so last question, just to um, just <laughs> what you're what you're speaking is is, is above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> so for people out here, and, and again, this is for the for the listeners and for myself. When should we call you? 
when when should the call come to you? Because what you're talking about again, maybe that fear factor. I know right now I'm like I don't I don't I'm gonna just raise these funds and get scholarships. But there's so much more we could do. When do we call you? So call me when you now, like when you're on a webinar and you have this little inkling of an idea, <laughs> this little whisper in your ear saying maybe I should lobby. Call me at the very beginning of you know that journey because I can help you from step one to step ten. Um, run an entire legislative advocacy campaign. So a lot of times the beginning for most organizations is just trying to get their board on board. <laughs> so right. my board of directors doesn't believe that you know, nonprofit lobbying is a, is a thing or they don't believe that it's beneficial. They don't believe that it's part of our mission. How do I convince my leadership that lobbying is, is um, something we should be doing? And so I, I hold workshops um, kind of um, convincing board members that this is an impactful thing that their organization should be doing. I help them go to the next step, which is learning about how to comply with lobbying laws. And then after that, creating an advocacy plan, building a bill proposal, and then actually approaching your legislator. So. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the first thought. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it can be overwhelming. It is. I get it. I get it's overwhelming. I think that's why nonprofits don't do it. But if you have somebody holding your hand like me to help you, then Absolutely. it's doable. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I want to give a shout out and then I have a follow up question. Great question, Mark. Um, be thinking of a next one. So I want to give a shout out to Eric Holmes. He's tuning in uh, from the Baltimore, Maryland area on Facebook. He's an author. Also, he's a community agent. He does so many great things in uh, the Baltimore community area. So follow him if you're in the feed. And if you're in the feed on Facebook and have questions, feel free to drop it there. If you're on the Zoom platform, feel free to, free to drop it there. Again, what we're doing tonight is the third quarter business development seminar. It's a two-part component. The first half, we're speaking with attorney Martin. She's specifically speaking to the 501c3 community, grassroots community that want to tap into how do they become a lobbyist? How do they champion their cause um, from a legislative perspective? Then we have a, a second attorney that's going to be joining us tonight. And she's going to be talking about trademark, intellectual property, um, contracts for partnerships, contracts if you're being brought into a situation or if you're bringing on clients. That's part two. Right now, we're back to attorney Martin. So realistically, how long can the process take? So realistically, it could take, you know, from one year to three or four years. I mean, it really just depends on, there's so many different factors that impact you know, whether a bill will be passed. And a lot of it is political. You know, is your is your party the party in power? Or is the party in power a party that has a platform that is pushing back against your issue? Um, and so it really, a lot of times, the legislature doesn't have your issue as a priority. And so you have to keep going back again and again and again to convince the legislature that this is something that needs to change. Um, I can give an example of one of my favorite examples of um, that, that type of work would be the California Can't Wait Coalition. Um, and so over the past decade or so, the California's public health system had been really suffering. It was severely under-resourced. It just really didn't have the capacity or resources it, need to serve, it needed to serve it, the um, community. Um, and so a group of nonprofits and public health advocates and even some corporate sponsors got together and created the California Can't Wait Coalition. Um, and they um, just basically educated legislators over a two month period about the um, the need for a additional funding for the uh, public health system. Um, and previous to that, they had been asking for funding over and over and over and over again. And the legislature, particularly the governor, um, just did not think that it was necessary. So they finally changed their approach and decided to sit down with individual legislators, le legislators and educate them about what the public health system was for, what it did, why it was important, how their own constituents were suffering from not having enough funding. And, um, and that was a session that was that worked. That was a session in which that legislature um, allocated an additional $3 billion per year towards the public health system. Um, so again, sometimes it could take years to get their attention for them to really see um, how their lack of funding or how their lack of um, prioritizing the issue is in, impacting their constituents. It could take you know a year to three or four years, but it's all about timing and um, polit politics and your approach. So. Got it. And you said something about yeah. they, they had to keep going back there. Where's mm -hmm. the, what, what, what does that look like? Oh, I'm sorry. So you have to keep, um, once you approach a legislator and ask them to introduce a bill, the bill can, again, is introduced into the legislature and it goes to different committees who decide whether the um, House and the Senate is going to vote on it. 
Sometimes that bill dies in committee. So if the members of the committee don't consider your bill to be a priority, or they don't think it's fiscally, like it's financially responsible, um, or they just don't think it's important, um, then that bill dies in committee and um, it's not considered at all for the rest of the legislative session. So you have to reintroduce that bill again the next session in hopes that the committee will um, prioritize it. Um, and so that's what I mean by going back and back, just basically reintroducing the same bill over and over again <laughs> until you know they find it important. I have another question. I'm going to pass it back to um, Mark. So with all of these steps, with all of these movable pieces that's needed, then why would a nonprofit do this? I mean, how can it make a profound impact in a community? By, mm -hmm. by going the route of, of being a lobbyist, you know, under your nonprofit? Um, well, I think the number one, well, the number of reasons, but I think the most compelling reason is that it's an overlooked source of funding. So like I just gave the example of the California Can't Wait Coalition, when they got that $3 billion to invest in the public health care system, for an individual nonprofit, that looks like grants to community organization, that looks like contracts to nonprofits who are into government contracting. So that, and that, then again, that that nonprofit um, is able to serve their community even better because they have those resources. But that came as a result of multiple nonprofits getting together as a coalition mm -hmm. and fighting for funding that could help the entire system. So it really leads to systemic change mm -hmm. um, that kind of trickles down to the micro level. And I think that's that's the part that nonprofits tend to overlook. Um, it's it's work, but it's so worth it on the macro scale. So. And you just brought it home for me with what you just said, and then I'm going to pass it on to Mark, um, by several organizations coming together. It wasn't just one. It was several organizations right. coming together. Um, and through that collaborative effort, they had one cause, and they were able to get the funding. I think you would say $3 billion or something? $3 billion. Uh, mm -hmm. $3 billion. Mm -hmm. And then from a systemic level, they was able to make change. So there are a lot of nonprofits out there that's doing great um, as an individual nonprofit. But the the really the meat and potato, I feel, of the conversation tonight with this first half is how can nonprofits come together as a coalition? And from mm -hmm. that, how can you use the tool um, of legislation and lobbying again, to, to move the needle forward and to create systemic change, right? Exactly. So it's a lot of mm -hmm. times we'll wake up We'll see something on the news or we'll wake up, we'll see something on social media and we'll say, man, it's still happening again. And I just want to encourage anybody that's watching now on whatever platform or you may be watching a replay. If whatever that thing that keeps gnawing at you over and over again and saying it's still happening again, maybe it's time for you to consider uh, going down the path of lobbying. And mm -hmm. again, I'm not the expert. Attorney Martin is the expert with it. So she just came out with a book, uh, the nonprofit lobbyist that will walk you through it, but also her personal counsel will be able to assist you as well. But again, the 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 meat and potatoes of what I'm taking away, and then I'm gonna pass it on to Mark for him to share his sentiments or any feedback or questions, is that the purpose of lobbying, it gets down to a systemic level. And it mm -hmm. helps create overarching change because it was through a collaborative effort with more than one nonprofit. Am I hearing you? Exactly. Yep. You summed it up better than I did. Do you want my job? Because you did no. that rather than I just like <laughs> No, that was perfect. That was good. Yeah. Mark. No. Uh, Attorney Martin, thank you. That's some great information. But I, I'm hearing you to say uh, a lot of things about the coalition and, and getting things together. And I'm I'm going to ask the question, you know, if if we are getting together, how close do we have to be? in alignment, like if I'm dealing with gun violence and you're dealing with gun violence, that's a winner. If I'm in gun violence and you're on, you know, food and children and, and hunger, how do we then, we still need to come together because one does have an effect on the other because it makes crime, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. is, is there an ability to find um, connective tissue on certain areas to make a coalition so we all can win? Because I think that's maybe a concern I would have, like mm -hmm. people don't want to work to get, we, well, our community has yeah. a little issue anyway, but in this particular situation, we could actually influence something bigger than ourselves. What do you say to that? Yeah, I would say that the most effective way is to find organizations that have your same mission. So, you know, all the homeless, um, all the organizations in a particular city that are working with the homeless need to come together. All the organizations who are working on child welfare issues need to come together. Um, and of course, there are issues that overlap, but it, it's, it's easier to work with people who have the same vision as you. Because if you have people who are competing for money for a child welfare system and money, competing for money for homeless issues, it's just, you're just not gonna get anywhere because it becomes like conflict of interest and you're pulling left and right. And because there's already an issue of nonprofits not working together, 
it's going to be easier to start with organizations that have your exact same mission. And so, yeah, that's what I would say to that. All right. And lastly, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I, I do motivational speaking. I'm all about getting people off the bench, as you can see. Mm-hmm. What, <laughs> what, what motivating thing can you say to those out here listening on the platforms and those who logged on to buy your book? Um, what would you say to them to encourage them? Hey, it sounded kind of tough, like I could give up at any given moment. There's a lot. What would you say to them as they start this journey or to have the inkling, as you said, to move in this journey? What would you say mm-hmm. to them so they would not give up? Um, it's worth it because you can impact more than just individuals. You can impact cities, neighborhoods, entire states. Um, it's our constitutional right. You know, I tell a lot of nonprofits, we're familiar with the right, our, our rights of freedom of religion. We're familiar with our freedom of speech, but we also have a right to petition our government to make changes that impact our community. And we, if we abdicate that right, if we give that up, you know, we're, we're really missing out on a powerful tool to make lasting change. I think a lot of nonprofits, you know, they, they don't think of it this way, but your goal should be to put yourself out of business. You know, I think that's what we really all want at the end of the day is for this issue just not to exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and the really, the only way to do that is to move beyond being a band-aid to really, um, really creating lasting change. Um, and it's, it's, it's can be overwhelming, but again, if you have the right help and the right support, it can be done because thousands of other nonprofits have done it before yeah. you. So they're, you're not doing it alone, mm-hmm. especially if you're in a coalition. Um, so there's really, there's, there's no excuse to really, if, if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. No one else is looking out for the little people, the marginalized, the vulnerable. You have corporations and, and special interest groups kind of monopolizing and taking over the legislative process and no one, um, marginalized communities don't have a seat at the table unless we give them one. Um, and so that's what I, I say to nonprofits all the time. If you don't do it, no one else will. Mm, that's powerful. Thank you. Yeah. You know, um, as we get ready to wind down this segment and introduce our next attorney, I just want to say to you one, thank you so much for coming on. I want mm-hmm. you to plug one more time, your book, your website, any social media handles that you would like to share. Absolutely. Yeah. My book is called the nonprofit lobbyist. Um, you can buy it directly from the website, which is called the nonprofit lobbyistbook.com. Um, you can also visit my business website, which is www.advocateimpact.com. Um, and there you can set up a call. We can talk more about how I can help you go from that little inkling, that little whisper to your ear, um, to creating a full like legislative advocacy campaign. So, um, yeah, I would love to work with you. And anyone that has followed me um, in my business, you know, I, don't, I only bring on qualified people, but not only qualified people that are passionate about what they do. And so attorney Martin and I, we connected on a personal family level. And then we just started talking and I learned about what she does. And it was just a lot of synergy there. And I have confidence in, but more importantly, I trust her practice. So if you're a nonprofit and you say, you know, you got this passion, but you just don't know how to submit legislation. You don't know the process of lobbying look no further. You're now able to connect with attorney Martin. Attorney Martin, thank you so much for coming on. Um, If you want, you can drop your information in the chat feed um, for those that's on the Zoom platform, and then I'll transpose that onto the Facebook platform. Okay, I will do it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. Listen, guys, uh, ladies and gents, we're about to go into our second phase of tonight. Um, and I am about to introduce our next attorney. I'm going to read snippets of the bio. And again, I have a personal testimony here. Um, she helped me, you know, when it came to my own organization. And I'll share that in a, in a little bit. But for those of you out there that saying, I don't, I, I want to get a trademark. I don't know how to, what's the process. I don't know what to do. Again, seek out for a professional that's skilled. So attorney Durant is a skilled and creative attorney with over 21 years of diversified experience in brand protection. She has a law degree and a master's degree in global leadership and a bachelor's degree in political science. You know, again, when we're thinking about building our business and building it strong, we have to seek out for qualified individuals. One of the other things is she's also a counsel to Anderson Kill and a member of the Intellectual Property Group. In addition to Anderson Kill, she is the managing partner of AMD Law Group. Personally, I have uh, experienced how her practice works when I needed that service. She concentrates her practice in intellectual property law and internet international business law. Without further ado, I would like to bring on Attorney Durant. Welcome. Oh, just hit the unmute. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. 
thank you so much for coming on. Listen, um, I'm going to start it off the same way I started off when I brought on attorney Martin. What was your passion? Why did you even decide to one day say, you know what? I want to be a lawyer. I want to make an impact in that industry. What, what was your, what, what drew you to it? Well, the interesting part is I grew up in an urban environment and a lot of us have that common story of growing up in an urban environment where we're part of a neighborhood. And um, I always wanted to go to college um, and I went to Temple University. And that was the first time I realized that what they were referring to as the ghetto was where I lived. Because once you're in that environment, you don't realize that it's it's marginalized or that it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's considered the ghetto. So I wanted to go to law school because I felt like that was the thing that one of the things that I could do to give me credibility, to give me voice, because when I was an undergrad, one of the things that I saw that was occurring is that we were, uh, the, the students of color were, were still marginalized. I went to a predominantly white university. Um, and so I got a law degree initially was so that people would be able to hear my voice because I felt like without having some degree of credibility or something that the wider culture thought was respectable that I wouldn't be able to have a voice. So that was really the reason why I went to law school because I figured, well, you know, I was a political science major and what can I do so that I can make things better for my family and what can I do so that I can have voice. So that was really the reason why I went to law school initially. And once I got in there, things changed and shift a little bit, but that was the initial purpose. And, and you know, I, I think for everyone that's out there watching now, we're gonna watch the replay, hearing the story behind why a person becomes whatever they become, I think is important. It draws us to that individual and everything that you're about to say with your presentation, we understand the why behind what you do. We're also joined by co-host, um, Mr. Mark Wiggins. Um, Mark, any initial questions before I boot up her PowerPoint presentation? Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm all for the PWIs, we get overlooked. Um, we had our own set of challenges <laughs> that we had to deal with on there. And I, I get the wanting to be heard and the position where people respect you because you feel like you got to work extra hard anyway. And if you're not shining out or, or standing for a cause or in a place where people can hear you or see you, they're not going to. And you, I appreciate you uh, speaking your truth on the PWI. I'm all for the HBCUs, let's be clear, but you know, it is what it is. It's where I got recruited and that's why I play ball. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So once again, for those that's tuning in right now, we have just transitioned. We was previously talking to attorney Martin, uh, dealing with lobbying for nonprofits. Now we are talking to attorney Durant. Um, there's many people that have posed the question, trademark, what is that? Intellectual property, what is that? Contracts, you know, how do I create one? Well, we have an expert with us on this evening to be able to share that information with you. Um, attorney Durant, I'm going to go ahead and queue up the PowerPoint for you, okay? Okay. Um, let me know when y'all can see my screen. I can see it. Okay, perfect. And you just let me know when you want me to flow to the next pages. Okay, all right. Well, I want to start with a, just a basic um, idea of why you would engage in intellectual property. Um, I generally look at intellectual property in the space of brand protection. So when you start your business, um, I use a, a phrase, it's called safeguarding your dreams by protecting your brand. Uh, when you start your business, it's like your baby. It's the thing that you're nurturing that you want to see grow. Um, and it's important to think about how you can protect it to make sure that you have ownership in it. Intellectual property is one of those items of personal assets that's transferable. So um, it lasts beyond the, beyond the life of your business, but the scope of intellectual property is covered by four different things that you can think about. The most common is trademark. So when you think about the Barbie movie, for example, Barbie is a trademark which identifies it to the Mattel company. Um, it's the brand that you're using in commerce is what your clients see. It's not the same as your business name. It's what's out in public. It's what you're using in your marketing, your social media, it's on your Instagram. Sometimes you might hashtag it. That would be your trademark that identifies that this is my particular product or my service. Copyright is how you would protect your 
artwork, your books, your photographs, your corporate manuals. And that what that means is you don't want anyone to be able to make unauthorized copies of your work. So as you're creating the intellectual property, you wanna make sure that you have ownership in it. And in both of those instances, you receive a certificate that proves that you created the work that you say that you created. Um, patent is if you, let's say you created a new, um, uh, a new form of a shopping cart. Um, and it has a useful purpose in commerce, you would protect it by patent. And then trade secrets, let's say that you don't wanna disclose what you have, you wanna keep it a secret. So for example, the formula for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. It's not, you're not gonna find it anywhere in any copyright, any trademark, in any patent. It's a business secret that's protected by a series of non-disclosure agreements and it's kept confidential. And they think that they've done a really good job of making sure that it can't be reverse engineered. So when you think about your business, think about what you have. Do I have a brand name that I'm using in commerce? Is my brand name unique and special? Am I using a logo to market? Um, do I have copyrights or my blog posts? Are they extra special that I need to be concerned about protecting them? Um, did I go out and I buy, pay a graphic designer to create this artwork for me? What do I have to do to protect that artwork? Um, so those are the things to think about when we go about starting our business. Um, how do I protect the things that I'm coming up with off the top of my mind that I'm putting out in commerce? And those are four ways that you can protect it. Uh, next slide. But beyond that, there's something called moral rights. So if I'm an author and let's say on the internet, someone takes my work and they make it into a meme, for example, and the meme is derogatory. Well, one of the things that I can do is not only can I cite them with some sort of infringement, I can also cite them with violating my moral rights because we have a right to have our work to be the way that we intended it to be. And that's something that is often overlooked when we think about the internet and how things are misappropriated, but we all have moral rights in what we create as our intellectual export. And then another form of intellectual property is our right to our personality and our publicity. That's name, image, and likeness. We hear about that in the context of sports athletes, but each of us have our own personal rights, personality rights, and our publicity rights to our name and image and likeness. So usually that comes into play when someone asks you to do, let's say someone wants you to go in and be a keynote speaker at an event, and they want to record the event, and they want to sell the, the items of the event. Well, what you're doing is you're giving them access to your name, image, and likeness. And that's, a lot of times we think that we don't have ownership in that, but we do have ownership in that in terms of you could actually, um, you know, agree to a release with some conditions and terms in it as to how your name, image, and likeness can be used or how it cannot be used. Next slide. And even broader, when you think about intellectual property, there are other aspects that impact it. So I do a good amount of contract work and that sometimes that's in the form of non-disclosure agreements to protect intellectual property. There are clauses that you can put in, uh, let's say a work for hire agreement where you, if you have somebody to work for you and they're creating a manual for you, you would put a clause in there that says that any items that come out of that are my intellectual property. Estate planning, let's say that I register my intellectual property in my personal name, and I don't register it in a business name and something were to happen to me, my intellectual property transfers as part of my, my estate. Corporate, let's say that I sell my business, all of my intellectual property that's in the name of the business or that's been licensed to the business as part of the business body that's part of the sale. Um, entertainment, um, if you think about, you know, if, if I'm an entertainer, I'm a musician, I'm a singer, all of that that I create, let's say that I go to a publisher and um, they're working on my book and I want to self-publish the book. I have to read the contract and make sure that I'm retaining all of my copyright. And sometimes I've even had clients where they would get a book self-published, but the copyright was never submitted because in the contract, the publisher said you were supposed to submit it. So that's, you know, when, when you think about this space of intellectual property, um, I'm somebody that's always on guard with how my IP is used. 
but the intersection of IP and other areas of law gives you something to think about when you think about how creative we are and how often we create things that can be monetized and that can be transferred, that can be part of generational wealth. The next slide. And then if you wanna know how you go about protecting those assets, you can do it by registering. You can register your copyright, you can register your trademark, you can file for a, a patent, um, you can do a provisional patent, you can do, there are ways that you can register those items. Um, you can do an assignment. Let's say that I have, I registered my trademark and I've gotten a certificate of registration and I want to um, sell, you know, my, my ID or my business to another party. I can do what's called an assignment agreement where I assign my intellectual property over to that third, that second party. I can do a license agreement. And that's where, let's say I have created a course curriculum and I wanna license it to a larger publisher, a publisher to produce it. Let's say that they have, um, you know, they have greater contacts than me, but they want my contact. I can do a license agreement where I can give them a non-exclusive license and I can say, okay, I want X amount of dollars for the license. So they get to use my content for a limited amount of time and they get to market it. They make money off of it, but I make money off of it as well through the license. Work for hire. Um, if I do hire someone to work on the content, I get them to sign what's called a work for hire agreement where I say to them, this is, I'm gonna pay you for doing this work. I'm gonna pay you X amount of dollars. And at the end of it, your copyright for that work transfers to me because when you think about copyright, copyright is based upon original authorship. Um, so if I'm a graphic designer and I'm creating a logo for you, I own that initial copyright. And it's by operation of law that I transfer it to you. The operation that most use is called a work for hire agreement. That has a provision in it that says that you agree to give me the copyright for the work that you've created. It also will say something like, in the event that this does not qualify as a work for hire agreement, you agree to assign this copyrighted work to me. So those are things that you can do when you have a, somebody that's producing items of intellectual property for you. And then a release, that's if you have, um, let's say um, the example of someone that's coming in as a speaker at an event. Most of the time, it's, good, it's a good idea for them to sign a release that gives you access to their name, image, and likeness for the purposes that you need it for. So it might be, it might say something like, um, you agreed to give me your name, image, and likeness in exchange for no compensation, but I'll give you X, and the, X amount of copies of this publication or this particular um, recording or whatever it might say. So those are the ways that you can protect the intellectual property assets that you have and that you acquire as you go throughout your business. And the th important thing to consider is that this is an ongoing process. Every time that you're creating anything, there, there needs to be some mechanism that says, is this an item of intellectual property? Is this a value? Is this something that I should be safeguarding and protecting? A uh, next slide. And then I just wanna talk a little bit about AI. Um, um, because, of course, that's something that, that's been talked about a lot um, and whether or not AI raises intellectual property questions. And there have been whole websites recently that have been created using AI. Um, there have been blog posts that have been written using AI. And some of the problems are is that um, there's a question as to whether or not there's any originality to it and certainly whether or not there's any creativity. Um, there's arguments that you can put in a search query and that's your creativity portion. But what comes out, there's questions about whether or not it's original. And if it is original, it, it may not be original to you. So I just bring that up because that's an area that's evolving. So I haven't had any clients that have asked me to protect anything that I knew was created using AI, but that's something to consider as you go about creating content and thinking about whether or not there's inventorship or whether or not there's original creativity attached to it. For some, it might be just a judgment call. You know, do you feel okay with protecting it? You know, did you change enough of what the AI 
spit out to make it make it feel like it's your own um that's a judgment call that has to be made next slide and then when should i start thinking about intellectual property um, a lot of times it comes up with a new business um, when you start your business or if you're expanding or if you're you're setting up a new product let's say you you know you want to go into um, let's say you're doing t-shirts and now you want to go into mugs and you might think, well, I'm doing really well in the t-shirts. Now I'm going to go into these mugs. Do I need, are there any considerations that I should have that I should think about? Um, you know, a, a lot of times when you see um, t-shirt companies that have slogans on their shirt that are in the shirts that are popular shirts, those are sometimes as copyright infringement, sometimes it's not. So when you think about intellectual property, think about it in the standpoint of, not only is, am I protecting my brand, but am I also protecting that I'm not infringing on someone else's brand? Um, and that's that's the converse to this, is that at least if you protect your brand, you know that you're entitled to use it, but also when you go throughout your business, you do have to be concerned about whether you're infringing on someone else's brand. So that's all I have for right now, and I'm open for questions, Catherine. I do have your questions here. You wanna fire them off. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to leave this page up um, with Attorney Durant's information. Just quick personal story before I go into the questions. So some of you may say, you know, how do I know, how do I pick the attorney that's going to be right for me? I can only share my testimony. I'm not getting all into the weeds of everything, but there was a situation that happened with me on my nonprofit side. And, you know, a lot of times we wake up and we say, we're going to do this good deed. You don't think someone's going to try to emulate or copy the exact same thing that you're doing. Well, that happened to me. Um, and I was connected to attorney Durant. Um, she did all of my paperwork. I was able to win the case and I got my trademark for my organization. And so I just say to anyone, if you're in the beginning phases, you may think it's small at that moment, but you never know how big your organization can grow. You never know where it can go. So it's best to safeguard it from the very beginning. I didn't have anyone to educate me in that arena when I first started. And so this is why I'm passionate about bringing on the attorneys tonight. So for those that might be in your beginning phases or whatever phase you might be in in your business, you don't have to, you know, not have the information. You don't have to walk around saying, who do I go to? Who can I talk to? We have individuals. And again, I trust Attorney Durant because she personally helped me. And one of the questions that I con constantly get that come my way and will pose this question, is there a difference with a trade name and trademark? Are they the same thing? Well, there is a difference. Um, the, a trade name is generally is, is the same as a DBA. So if I'm operating and I want to use a name other than my corporate name, then I would use what's called a trade name. A trademark is my brand that I'm using in, in commerce. And then also a service mark, I'll make that distinction too. A service mark is if I have a service-based business, I might call it a service mark. Um, so I, it, you know, it's important to understand that trademark protects your brand, the brand name that you're using in commerce throughout the entire United States. When you register your LLC or your corporation, it allows you to operate within that state that you're in. So when you register a DBA, generally it will allow you to operate within that business, but it doesn't extend outside that state. So from a general tax purpose, any state that you have lots of contacts in, you're supposed to be opening yourself up for taxation. A lot of new business owners think that if I have the LLC, that means I have the trademark. It doesn't mean that. It means that you have the right and the ability to use that name in that particular state. So even if you register a DBA, in the name of your trademark, it still doesn't get you the same coverage as it would if you register a trademark. Okay, and a trademark that covers you for how many states? All of the states. All of the states. So for mm -hmm. those that's tuning in now or are gonna watch the replay because we are recording this, this is viable information. Mr. Mark Wiggins, did you wanna hop on with any questions or comment? Uh, yes, right quick. Uh, thank you, uh, Attorney Durant. I'm over here uh, cringing. I was like, oof, I need to look into that. <laughs> so thank you for bringing it to light, especially as a speaker, as, as a content creator, you brought up some great points. Um, but let me ask you this quick question. What, in your opinion, would be the first thing we would need to protect, trademark or 
uh, business mark or whatever, what would be the first thing you would recommend? Well, I would certainly say it's your, your forward consumer facing brand name that you're using in commerce. It would be that, whatever that name is. Um, so, you know, for you off the bench magazine, you know, that would be, you know, cause I see that that's forward facing to me. That would be what I would focus on is what's out there in the public first. Um, and then I would move to um, maybe a tagline if you're using a tagline. So for example, a tagline is Nike's just do it is their tagline. So if you're using something to identify your business, because a lot of a lot of businesses that are new don't have name recognition. So you need a tagline so that people get it because people don't just get it if they don't know anything about your business. So you'll add a tagline that explains it a little bit better. And that too can be protected by trademark. So I would focus on there. The, the, whatever you're using in commerce is what I would focus on. Oh, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another common question that, that's often asked is, um, and you talked about intellectual property, but like, let's say if someone has an idea, can that idea be protected or what, what technically can be covered under the law? Well, ideas can be protected, um, but a tangible embodiment of the idea can. So I have to do something with the idea beyond just think about it. Um, a lot of times people will share ideas with other people and the person that they share it with will take it and run with it mm -hmm. uh, before you get a chance to run with it. Well, they can do that because it was just an idea. It was a thought in your head, but you didn't, you didn't create a website. You didn't create a logo. You didn't use it in commerce. You didn't do any of that. All you did was think about it and share it. Um, so that's why a lot of times it's important to not share it because they might beat you to it. Um, and for trademark, in the U.S., it's first to use. Outside the U.S., it's first to file. So when you're in the U.S. and you use a particular brand name first, you have what's called priority, priority use in that particular brand name. But the problem is that if you share it, the person can use it and establish priority before you get to do it, before you actually get around to doing it. Um, so... I would, I would say that um, it's important to not share the ideas and to actually put it in a tangible form. But also, I think what's also important is to, to do a little bit of searching to make sure that the idea that you have is really original. You know, that saying that there's nothing new under the sun is really true, because a lot of times people think they have something and they really don't. So I spend a lot of time searching and, and sometimes I feel like I dash some hopes because I'll look it up and I'll say, well, somebody's been doing this since 1920. You just didn't know about them, but they have priority rights. Mm -hmm. And in the U.S., it's based upon per first to use. Yeah. No, I think this is viable information for those that's watching now, watching later. We're speaking with Attorney Durant. Again, if you have an idea, what I'm my takeaway from what you just said, one, you need to do your research. Make sure you research. And then two, after you've done it, even simultaneously, you know, keep it to yourself. You should not be out there advertising what you're, what you're attempting to do before it even manifests and you don't have any, um, nothing documented on what you're trying to do. And so um, another common question that's often asked, and you did talk about copyright. So is copyright only limited to written text? No, copyright is any expression with a, in the, in the law, it's called a modicum of creativity. So if I, um, if I create, let's say that I take out a piece of paper and I start drawing some kind of diagram or something like that, that is actually my copyright at work. I have common law rights to that particular embodiment. So it could be a photograph, it could be a computer program, it could be a, a play that I wrote, it could be a music composition. It's just when I've sat down and I've created something off my head that has some modicum of creativity. Also, copyright extends to, extends to derivative works. So you're allowed to, I guess, sample to some extent and create a, a new work from an existing work, and that's called a derivative. So any, anything that, that's tangible that I can actually point to as an expression, so if I can play my song, if I can show my art, if I can read my book, if I can perform my play, those are items of copyright.
There's three last questions. And we want to give a shout out also to Mr. Ronnie Francois, who has joined us on Facebook. For those of, the, of you that's on Facebook, thank you for tuning in. Um, the next question, another common question. What are the fundamental components of a partnership agreement? So, you know, people, you know, may want to come together and do business together. What, what are some of those fundamental ingredients to do that? I think the, the what I think what I think should happen with anybody that's going into a partnership, I think there should be at least an informal understanding, um, not not a full blown deal sheet or anything like that, but an informal understanding of what the expectations are, um, what the well, first of all, what the business is, uh, what each party is going to do, what are the capital contributions for the business. What is a succession plan? How are we going to handle it if something were to happen to one of us? What happens if one of us wants to pull away? I think that it's a good exercise to, before you go to a lawyer and say, we want to be a partner, to see if you have a meeting of your minds informally first, so that you can then go to that lawyer and say, this is what we want. Because it may turn out that maybe a partnership is not what you should be doing, because you may find that your, your partners don't want to contribute capital? Um, are they, they don't want to do the work? Are they disagree about what the form of the business is? But the elements of the agreement itself are those things that I've outlined. It's, it's who's going to do what? What's our succession plan? What's the capital? What's this business that we're creating? And those are the essential elements that go into the partnership. Awesome. Just two final questions. The next common question we often get is, my business is growing and I'm getting new clients, but I don't have a contract for the services. How do I create that contract? And do I need one? What are some fundamental things I should have for a client contract? Well, of course, I'm biased. I'm going to say you absolutely need a client contract so that you know who's, again, who's doing what, what the expectations are. The termination, how can I get out of this contract if I decide I don't want to work with this client anymore? Um, you know, or the client decides they don't want to work with me anymore. Um, how is the compensation going to work? Um, so a contract gives everybody an opportunity to have a, a, you know, understanding of what we're going to do together. And without that, you're hanging loose. Um, you know, you can have a verbal agreement where you can have a series of verbal discussions or emails and try to put that together as a contract if there's a dispute, but why would you wanna do that? Um, so I think that you need a contract just so that you are held accountable and your client is held accountable for what you say you're gonna deliver. Mm -hmm. And then the final question, how can a business owner retain law, your law practice services if they should need any of the things that was discussed on tonight? Um, the best way is to email me, send me an email. Um, I, I can put the email in the in chat. The chat box. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can also call me. Um, my number is 202-465-9596. Drop that 202. Say that one more time, please. 202-465-9596. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I think it's a question in the chat from Dr. Leroy. He said, you mentioned trade secrets. Uh, does Coke have to place their ingredients on their bottles? Well, they, they have to place, they have placed the, the, the general ingredients, but the composition of the formula is not there. So that that's protected by the trade secret. So you can say syrup and you can say sugar, but you don't know the amounts from that. So they've done it in a way that you, even if you know what the ingredients are, you're supposed to not be able to reverse engineer it. So the other brands of cola, I mean, I don't drink Coke, so I don't know if they taste like Coca-Cola to me or not, but I, but they're not able to reverse engineer it because you don't know the percentages that go into it. So yeah, you'll see the ingredients, but there's really just syrup. <laughs> Right, right. So thank you for that question, Dr. Leroy. Um, Attorney Durant dropped her email in the chat feed. And for those that's on Facebook, I'll also transfer her information that's on Zoom onto Facebook so you can get that. And tonight has been recorded. Um, shortly, it will be up on our YouTube page for those um, that want to look at it on replay there, or you can just hit the replay right on Facebook. For those that was a part of the uh, Zoom platform, we thank you for joining us. 
this information is important as we continue to grow our business we're in the third quarter of the year information like this is what we need to make sure we have a rock solid business so attorney durant thank you so much for joining us on tonight and and sharing gems uh to help us continue to build and grow even further so thank you for that any okay. final words that you would like to share before we close out no, I'm going to leave it with safeguard your dreams by protecting your brand. So give some thought. I, I hope I've given a, a lot of people something to think about and to go back at what they have and see how valuable it is because there, there's wealth in there. There's wealth. There's wealth in there. Yeah, it was a lot of pieces that you shared on tonight. I know I'm personally going to hit the replay and listen to it again. And again, for those that um, you know, might be meeting attorney Durant for the first time. I personally use her or her services so I can vouch for the quality of work that her practice does. And we thank everybody once again for tuning in. Next month, we're going to be back with new presenters, new topics, um, as we always do. So with that being said, everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.